Welcome, everybody. This is the inaugural uh, broadcast. And this is not a, just a podcast. It's also a YouTube series. My name is Alan Vaisberg, and I have my first guest and the wonderful Michael Kostrov. Hi, Michael, and thank you so much I, for coming. I don't think I knew I was the first guest. Now I'm even more excited. I'm really honored. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I have a number of people uh, kind of uh, scheduled, uh, some casting directors, yeah. other uh, wonderful actors, but you're the first one that uh, we scheduled in time. So it actually is apropos for me. Uh, number one, it's right before your birthday. So here is hopefully a good early birthday present for you. Thank you. Um, speaking of which, how, how are you doing in this time of uh, COVID? Uh, everything okay? Hopefully you and your family are good? Yes, you know it's it's that's always a hard question for everyone to answer because I, yeah. I'm actually I'm I'm fine, but it sort of doesn't make sense that I'm fine because it's a weird time, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It I I've been able to stay a lot busier than I expected. I'm teaching mm-hmm. online. I'm I'm participating in readings and all kinds of things, and I it's keeping my brain my brain together. So, good, good. That's, how are that's... you? Um surprisingly well and um you know knock on wood as well uh i have two uh kids a high schooler and a uh, elementary schooler and yeah. you know i think everybody kind of has gotten into some sort of a rhythm um so so far so good you know keeping fingers crossed and um, hopefully all of this comes to a um sooner than later good uh <laughs> good oh. ending um okay uh, also, and uh, let's give thanks where thanks is due. Uh, I came across, uh, you know, I've seen you in in many things, obviously, but um, I came across your interviews uh, uh, in a podcast, a wonderful podcast called The Action, Pursuit of Acting Excellence. That's done by Lee Foster. So Lee says Great. hi. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's excellent. We're going to link it uh, below this. Uh, yeah. I want everybody to check it out on iTunes and other podcasts. But uh, Lee says hi, and um, I really... Kind of that's where I got to know you as a person by listening to some of the podcasts, and then I stopped listening because I wanted to talk to you and I wanted to ask my own questions. Yeah. Um, so um, I have to say that you know, looking at your career, it, it makes me smile because if I'm if anybody were to ask me what is your favorite Broadway show of all time, my favorite Broadway show is Producers. That's not even a question. It's my show, and you're in my favorite show, and you've done I've, that. I've, I've, I've done it six times now. Six times, it's it's amazing, yeah. and national tour, and then some regional uh, stuff as well. It's it's exactly. I, I love it. Um, it's then we kind of look at the other side of it, right? We look on the on screen, and my favorite TV drama of all time is The West Wing, where you've been. My second favorite TV drama of all time is Billions, where you've been. My fourth uh, favorite TV drama of all time, The Wire, you've obviously uh, been in. Wait, what's the one that I missed? That's your third. The third uh, for me is um, so West Wing, uh, Billion Suits. Uh, Suits is my third. Uh, four, fourth is The Wire, and then uh, Newsroom is uh, is the fifth one. Um, I was uh, looking around to see if you were in Newsroom, but you were not in Newsroom. Uh, I think Dulé. Very organized, though. You're or- so organized in your choices. <laughs> it's good. I, I I had to think about that yesterday as I was preparing for uh, for a discussion. I thought, okay, well, I know for sure that you know, producers for me is number one. But what are my other Broadway shows that I really love? So I went and I ranked them, uh, and then I did the same thing for the TV dramas because I kind of have that. I also have TV comedies. Don't ask me what my favorite movie is because I, I still cannot figure it out. There are so many that I, I just I can't put them in a proper list of categories. I, um, I can't pick a favorite of anything, so I'm very impressed. <laughs> well, it, it took it took a little while. So thanks to you, I wouldn't have done it otherwise. You're um, so you've kind of you've been in all of these things. By the way, uh, I'm looking forward to. I just started watching season five of of Billions, so I know Wags Revenge is coming for you shortly. Uh, I don't say anything, but I am definitely looking forward to that part. Um, so looking at such a, a such kind of a storied um, and varied career, when people would ask me, what is it that I want for my acting career? Um, the answer is I'm not after fame. I'm not after uh, you know money or that type of recognition. I just want to be in things that I enjoy and play interesting roles. And yeah. It seemed like you have done that. How much fun is it to have the career that you have had so far? It's so much fun. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie. First of all, I I was a very late bloomer. I had so many like issues to to work through as a young man that my career didn't really start till I was in my. I mean, 
I didn't start acting with any regularity until I was in my mid to late 30s. Mm-hmm. So I'm still in this place of like, wow, it's, ha- it's happening. You know, I, I mean, I still am such a geek about it. Um, and uh, the variety of it, I mean, it's so funny to me because I, you know, I do these loud, you know, funny characters on stage and then these really like dark, serious, horrible people on on, on screen. And it's... yeah. I mean, I feel, I'm not going to lie, there's no other way to describe it. I just feel very, very lucky. There are surely much better actors than I who haven't had the career that I've had. That's, it's, so I think it's amazing that I get to do the musical theater stuff and I get to do the, you know, TV drama and, um, and all over the place like that. And I, 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 I always tell people that I, I'm a great advocate of low expectations because everything has exceeded my expectations. <laughs> Everything in my career has exceeded my expectations. I, I certainly didn't even expect to be able to make a living at it, much less to be an expert and you know people yeah. want to interview me for something. You know, it's it's um, it's lovely. It really is. It's it's beautiful. Um, um, going back to the wire for uh, for a bit and then talking about Maury, who uh, you know by the way was probably my second most disliked character on the wire. Uh, well, Mar- it's, good. it's it's all about lists. It's the it's the you know, analytical nature of being a programmer as my, you know, uh, day job. Uh, it's all about categorization lists and uh, putting oh, things yeah. in databases. Yeah, uh, Marlo was my first uh, uh, most disliked character. Um, so I wanted to ask you a question in, you know, because I know that I've heard you uh, say that, uh, you know, that character on The Wire is very far away from you. And I, I for me personally, in my very short acting career, the most fun I ever had was playing a character in a student film that I'm not sure if it even aired, but I was asked to play a drug uh, drug using sex uh, addict, uh, self-obsessed ED spokesperson, motivational speaker. And that was the most fun I've ever had because I could just let go. This person is nothing like me and I can just go have fun. So. Is it more fun for you to play uh, characters that are like yourself or completely unlike yourself? You know, I'm going to answer you the same way I answer when people say, do you prefer theater or, or film? The answer is yes. I, I like all of it. Um, okay. By the way, since we're on this topic, yeah. um, Jamie Hector, who played Marlo, is one of the people from The Wire that I've stayed in touch with the most and Lovely. is one of the kindest most studious, uh, uh, spiritually deep people that I know. Uh, he also is nothing like this character. He runs this wonderful organization called Moving Mountains that is taking inner city kids and giving them like, all, not only you know teaching them acting and other skills, but but life skills. And the, the, it's it's a great organization, Moving Mountains. I'm you know yeah. I encourage everybody to donate to it. So. You know, I, I I do think it's fun. I I I am nothing like Maury Levy. I spent the whole time going, I can't believe I'm getting away with this, <laughs> and that was fun. And then you know, one of my most recent projects was um, something called The Plot Against America, which was on HBO, and I finally played somebody closer to me who's you know was sensitive and concerned about what was happening in the country and yeah. a little quieter, you know, which is more like me. And um, and that was great too to be able to just just play somebody closer to myself. I've had a, only a couple of TV roles that I was like, this guy, this is like me. This is, this, I really relate to it. But, I, but the variety, again, I keep going back to the variety. Just like what you were saying is your goal for your career. That's yeah. mine too. I just, I want to keep playing different roles. I want to keep creating. I, you know, I, I, I don't need to be famous. I don't need to be, you know, uh, disgustingly wealthy. A little disgustingly wealthy would be good. But, you know, I, yeah. uh, I just love that I keep getting to do these different things. Uh, yeah, it's 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 perfect. Um, yeah. Actually, I think I may know the answer to this next question based on what you just said. But you know, um, correct me if I'm wrong. But based on my kind of research and recollection, you were a series regular on The Wire, and then everywhere else you've been recurring guest stars, co-stars. Um, Putting aside the, you know, it would be st- stable and much more money and prestige and everything else of being a regular on the show. But do you have a preference of where, if you had a chance of being a regular or being a recurring? Do you have a preference? And not to get you into tr- trouble for any future projects. No, 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 no. Listen, I, I told you I'm an open book. Uh, yeah. It actually depends on the show. I, 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 
once in my career, I turned down a series regular, which might sound crazy, hmm. but I was offered a series regular on a, on a Disney Channel series, okay. which would have made me exclusive to that show for, I think they were asking for a six-year commitment. Okay. And it sounded like a dream job. And, and um, my manager said to me at the time, he said, you can't take this because it hmm. means you can't do any other films, any other series. And do you want to be known as a Disney, strictly Disney guy? I went, no, I don't. Um, we yeah. worked that one out and I, I, we, we went back to them and said, how about make Michael a recurring guest star? And they're like, that's much less money for us. That's great. <laughs> it worked out for everyone. But I, I, I think yeah. it's a, you know, at, at that point, it's about career shaping. But uh, at this point, I, I very much would like to be on a, on a series again as a series regular. I've done it actually a few times. Um, but I, but I, I would really like to be on, on, um, you know, just just a a, a show that uh, just a high quality show that 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 would be artistically challenging for me and that uh, would reflect the kind of work that I like to do. So I, that could be a lot of things, though, for me. I mean, because I yeah. I'd be just as happy on a sitcom as I would on a, a you know network procedural. But yeah, I, I kind of right now just are just money aside. I, I'm mm -hmm. really craving the consistency like you have in theater where you get to keep honing this character and keep coming back to it again and again and, uh, and to have a uh, listen you know the, the bottom line is working I like working but um, I would be really interested in being a series regular again at this point um, just artistically gotcha no that's it makes sense and yeah. um, you you have mentioned money so you know as a as a reality check question um, you know, you've you have 94 you know TV and uh, and you know film credits uh, uh, so far. Are you at a point in your career where you're still worried about having a job as an actor, or uh, at any point you feel like you're going to have to go and get something else just to pay the bills? Yes, I, you know, I have to warn you. Anything you ask me, I I, I tend to want to answer six different ways. <laughs> I worry because it's in my nature to worry. So that that doesn't have to do with reality. Okay. But uh, no, I'm you know, um, uh, yes, I, I am still at the point where I where I need to need to be concerned about the next job. I'm not you know independently wealthy. I also live in New York, which is you know in a, a fairly expensive apartment. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I mean, I've been lucky enough to make my living as an actor for the last you know decade or so. But I also do other things. I mean, I, I coach actors and I teach and I, <clears throat> I've written several books. I'm working on another. And um, um, so I don't know if I'm answering your question well enough, but, yeah. I, but I, I think um, I think, yeah, the answer is no, I am not at a point where I don't have to ever worry about working again. <laughs> not by a long shot. Good, because I think that's it's a it's a valuable reality check. You know, yes, because it is. People can see and see you on all of these shows, and not just you specifically, but can see actors on all these shows and say, "Okay, well, you know, that person doesn't have to do anything for the rest of their life." That's not the case. Yeah. Honestly, this, you know, Alan, this is why I'm so open about stuff, uh, I, and um, people are sometimes surprised by how candid I am about, you know, the crap I went through in my childhood and and finances, and because I I don't like this weird distance of I'm not trying to prop myself up as uh, as being on a on a different level than anybody and I, I'm, I'm still a blue collar actor trying to make a living and do my thing i've just been lucky in a lot of ways but yeah. i think it's valuable for people to see that the guy that they see on tv has insecurities and weirdnesses and, and concerns about paying the rent and all that stuff yeah. i really do i i agree with you and that's why um honestly i was so kind of uh, touched uh, when i heard you on lee's uh, podcast because mm -hmm. it seemed to be an open book and it seemed to be a genuine, yeah. honest uh, assessment of, you know, here's the real life and situation of it. And I said, I want to talk to this guy. Yeah, I liked seeing him in much in uh, lots of stuff, but I want to talk to this guy because that's what this is about. And I want to know mm -hmm. the reality of it. And I want to know the actual person, not the persona that they're trying to be. So that that yeah. to me is is really um, something that I appreciate a lot. And I pre and thank you for that. Speaking of uh, something that you're passionate about, which is uh, auditioning, um, I did buy both of your books. Um, one is arriving, I think, tomorrow, and one is arriving on Monday. So I'll get to read the, them very soon. Um, the best 
kind of uh, audition advice that I have ever heard was from John Levy, who I, I cast you in ER and uh, West Wing. Um, and John said that when you're reading for me, you're not there to impress me as an actor. You're there to show if you're believable as the character. That's it. And that kind of was a turning point for me because in you know the little co-star and everything else that uh, you try to audition for at my level, you're always trying to show your range as an actor. And that's not what it's about. So you know, I know you have a ton of advice on auditioning, but if you had to take your three you know top advices uh, on auditioning, what would they be? I know me again with my lists. <laughs> this is uh, I'll tell you why this is hard, but I will uh, I will attempt an answer. You know, I, uh, just to fill people in who may not know, I, I've been teaching this class called Audition Psych 101 yep. for about 15 years now because I had a terrible time auditioning when I started my career. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Not only at the start, in the middle, you know, I, 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 I personally was very shy and had a terrible time presenting myself in public to begin with, but also auditioning is, you know, ner can be nerve wracking. Um, and um, I have, uh, over the years, revisited my thoughts about it and sort of checked them for logic. And I've been able to really walk myself to a place where I, I really love auditioning now. I love it. And so that's, you know, I teach this class and it's a four hour class, mostly me talking. So mm -hmm. there's lots of, there's lots of observations, but what I love is, again, I love being of service and I love hearing from actors that changed my career, that changed my life. And, you know, so that's great. Um, which is why I put it out in book form so the people who are in places that I don't visit with the class can read it. Um, um, you're asking me to, to, to share my, my, or any three. It doesn't have to be the top three. Any three that you think would uh, come well, to... Pick up on, you know what? I'm going to pick up on what John Levy said because he's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, we, get, we get in this very strange mindset as, as auditioning actors of trying to do it right, do it well, impress somebody, be good, be liked, or be cast. Those are a bunch of things we cannot control. We can't control any of those things, whether people like us or don't like us. But also the problem is that that pulls us off the task. And... I figured out that in acting, trying to get a job is not conducive to getting a job. And the reason why is that the job we're applying for is ER technician, dentist, crazed killer, grieving mom, you know, yeah. uh, sleazy lawyer. We want people to be able to watch that and go, that's a sleazy lawyer. You know, oh, that guy who just walked in and out, that's a UPS driver. And we want to and allow people to forget that they're seeing actors. So when we come in with all this effort and trying, and you know, trying to charm, and we're being people applying for an acting job, and nobody wants to watch that on TV. So it's a little counterintuitive, as are many of my theories. But uh, trying to get an acting job is not conducive to getting an acting job. What is is, you know, what I call just you know doing the task of the actor. Meaning, you know. Um, if I have to tell somebody that the, that, that the bus is arriving in 10 minutes, I just go in and tell the, the reader because the reader doesn't know. I, I gotta go tell them. And, and I just do the task of, of making sure they get that information. And then it's uh, so much easier as opposed to trying to crack this weird code. Does yeah. that make sense out of context? I hope it does. Yeah, it does. Uh, they yeah. play, play the profession. Uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's what uh, you're referring to. And it's... Um... Much easier than it's yeah. so much easier and less less emotionally and mentally exhausting than trying to crack the code of what's going yeah. to be the version that they'll choose. Because I listen, I have been cast in parts that I know I was not the best choice for. Huh. I mean, I, I I I think they made a big mistake in several cases. There have also been times that they didn't cast me that I I mean we can't control these things. We can't. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many times I'm like, oh, I totally nailed that one. Nothing. Forget it. No. Yeah. So, I I, uh, I I think overall my philosophy has a lot to do with sort of unwinding some of these faulty mythologies that we suffer under. Yeah. You know? No, um, that's perfect. Yeah. Um, getting into uh, again, kind of piggybacking what you were saying now. Um, when you're in that scene, and let's uh, let's raise the stakes a little bit. So if it's not a co-star, kind of the five and under uh, things, but a guest star recurring, uh, and you're there, and you know, for actors, we we know this. For those who are not actors that are looking at this, there are 
uh, when we're talking about a scene and shooting a scene in film or TV, it's not one take or one thing. It's many different shots. You have the wide shots, you have the coverages, you have the close-ups, you have all sorts of different shots, and you're doing the same scene over and over and over and over and over again. It can take hours. So um, again, in my short career, I found that I had to kind of really unplug and plug back in in order to stay sane during that process. What are some of your advices about being on in every take? And do you do that? Do you try to do it the same way all the time? Or do you just connect to it? And if it comes out different, it comes out different. What's your approach on it? Well, let me go backwards. So yes, the last thing you said is true. I don't I, I don't get obsessed with trying to replicate. Now, obviously, once yeah. once we've shot what they call the master shot, yes. uh, which is the you know, big take, um, you don't want to ch- you don't change your blocking. You know, yeah. you try to generally match your movements. But mm-hmm. I don't try to replicate a performance ever because sometimes they'll the director will say, "Oh, I, I like what you did on this last take. That was that was a, a different take on it, and it worked." And and we leave that to the editor and the director to decide. Yeah, that's when good. When you say unplug, are you talking about between? takes or between yeah. time on set. Yes. So I used to spend the whole day vigilant, like ready to go. I'd come in at 6 a.m. ready to go. I'm yeah. ready. If you ever need me, I'll be like like a SWAT team. Yeah. And um, like, yeah, it's gonna be a few hours. Okay, but if anything changes, let me know. You know, part of that was like my anxious caretaking, but also it it's not sustainable. Um and you know again because we're prone to worry, I, I think we all are. You know, I used to worry, okay, what if they can't find me? What if they forget about me? Or what if they, all these things that are not going to happen. They, these yeah. people are very good at what they do. So, you know, they know you'll be in, you know, in, in whatever area you were supposed to be in to wait to, to work. And yeah. you don't have to remind them. You don't have to check in. You don't have to be hyper aware. I don't even get into wardrobe until they tell me to now because sometimes it's hours. And I've, I've gotten so much better at going, I'm going to bring a computer. I'm going to bring a book. I'm going to not yeah. worry about anything until they tell me we're almost ready, you know? Okay. And most of the time there's a warning. They'll, they'll say, oh, it's going to be about a half hour, you know, or okay. time to get dressed. And, you know, like I, I no longer go, do you want me to go to the makeup trailer? Because they always tell me, they, they, like, it's time to go to the makeup trailer. So, so, yes, it is unsustainable to spend a whole day alert, aware, prepared, on deck, and ready to film. And we yeah. worry that we're going to forget what we were going to do or that we're going to lose it. It's it's not sustainable. So yes, I agree with you. I unplug in between. Yeah, I just I found that it's so energetically draining uh, that I I couldn't handle it, and I had to kind of just plug in, plug out. Especially mm-hmm. if you know uh, I was shooting um, for one of the shorts that I did. It was a scene in which a father loses a daughter, and he just hears about it, and somebody comes in and says, "Your daughter just committed suicide." Yeah. Uh, Actually, it's cool because I'm saying it now and I'm swelling up already that there is that emotion that I yeah. I, guess I was uh, I still feel. But how do you keep every take fresh? How do you cry in you know most of these takes? How do you do it? It's exhausting. And I I had to kind of get back, breathe. Okay, I'm good. Yeah, okay, yes. And then having that trust to yourself that when it's time that you can actually plug back into it. And it, it took a while, but it's it's an exhausting uh, and exhilarating process. Yeah, I did one scene. Uh, I forgot what the show was, but uh, uh, but but I was my character had been drugged, and oh. that was the one time that you know between takes. In other words, not all day. Yeah. But when we were actually in the film in the filming of the scene, and we were actually working on the part that I was in. Mm-hmm. I did sort of try to not engage with people in between. I didn't want to get too alert. I, I sort of kept myself to myself and yeah. kept that going. So that's that. That's the only time I can think of. Um, but again, it was not the whole day and not the whole time that we were filming the scene. Just the time that we were on my coverage. You know. Yeah. So, no, makes yeah. sense. Thank you. Um, in terms of working with people um, on a set and continuing to do it, you know, my. Uh, I didn't get the role. I was on check avail. Um, but my biggest potential uh, <laughs> role was as a recurring guest star on a uh, series starring Ethan Hawke. So once they said check avail, I went through this whole range of emotions, ranging from holy shit, I could be in a scene, not just a few awards, but in actual scene with Ethan Hawke. Am I good enough? 
uh, I don't know how to handle it. It's Ethan Hawke to, okay, relax. We're all professionals. We're all good people. We're all trying to work and you'll figure it out. I didn't get it. So I didn't have to, you know, actually implement that practice. But you've worked with a few heavyweights <laughs> uh, on screen. How do you handle that of being with somebody with that type of caliber and uh, notoriety? This is a great, great great question that you've asked. I don't Thank think you. I've been asked this before. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm trying to think about where, where, where to start on this. Uh, forgive the pause. I'm just, I'm just sort mm -hmm. of figuring out like where, where I want to start in my answer because it's, uh, it's, it is such a good question. Mm -hmm. um, what I, my experience with, big name actors, mm -hmm. is that when you're encountering them on set, they're at work. Yeah. They're in a bubble where they want, where they would, most of them would like to be protected from fans, nervous people, you know, people who treat them like they're some kind of, you know, celebrity, mm -hmm. because it's not the most comfortable place to be. They want to be able to do their work. It's hard to do your work if you're on red carpet mode, you know, or, or you know, it's a different mode. Now, I will tell you, I'm not, I'm not a celebrity, but I do get recognized on the street. It's very nice. It's very flattering. I can't do my work in that kind of environment. It's very nice. I would not want to play a scene with one of those people because it's exhausting. Now I've got to take care of them. So mm -hmm. the, the best way to, 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 quell those fears is to is to think about the needs of the other person and this is something that i think comes up again and again to think about the needs of the casting people to think about the needs of the of your fellow actor helps you calm down mm -hmm. when i think about like okay i was i was in a scene with sally field i was like if i come on set nervous and like a big fan now she's got a whole other job to do which is to get me calm enough to do the scene yeah. and to deal with my nerves about meeting her and that's not fair to her at the end of the day this is a fellow actor who wants to do her work and i find that in many cases i'm in a conversation with them talking about how to make the scene good we end up like like a couple of actors in acting class going yeah well what okay so maybe it's this you know and we're talking with the director and it's you know it, it is a service to them to hide whatever nerves that you have I want to address the other thing you said, which is that we all we all ask, "Am I good enough? Am I good enough?" Mm -hmm. And I think um, we really have to trust that casting people and directors know how to do their job, and that if they've cast us, they haven't made a huge mistake. <laughs> Film and TV, actually, just about everything is is expensive, and yeah. they make those decisions carefully. It's not that they never make a mistake, but the chances of them making a mistake, you know. And that you're going to ruin the project, and that you, you know, you're the mistake is is very very slim. And I think we all go to that place of like, oh no, they made a mistake casting me, and they're going to fire me. And it's like, it it's you have to trust. Okay, whether I whether I believe in my talent or not, they decided I'm the guy, so I'm the guy. You know. No, the, that's the, fair. Yeah. Last thing on that is I want to this this ties in well to what I was telling you about auditioning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, if Ethan Hawke needs to know what's in the report that just came down from the, you know, from the court, he's not going to know if I don't tell him. So I have to come tell him. Otherwise, he's not going to know. Sure. And that makes the job so much easier. Yeah. Um, I want to I want to dive a little bit more on the being good enough, uh, because, again, I. Uh, this this seems to be more of my own personal counseling uh, session um, as I'm asking this question. But I, no, I but remember. Let me, let me just tell you, this is universal. What I, I, stuff, I we all think we're the only ones who are this insecure. All of us are. So go on. That's that's good to know. Because um, I was watching The Wire, and uh, uh, in this case, I want to make sure I'm not talking about you at all. Um, I was watching The Wire, and um, immediately I saw that one of the leads is not a great uh, actor. Uh, and this is not not being judgmental, but in, in scene with a ton of great actors, that person is not as good. And mm. I immediately, it kind of threw me for a loop because I thought, oh my God, if I get to that level, is that what I'm gonna look like uh, in presence of great actors? And then it went to, well, you know, this person obviously is good and they got cast in an HBO series 
as a as a one of the leads um so somebody saw something the person obviously knows what they're doing and i just went through that whole spiel of being good enough and how you know when you're on set and you know that the other people are delivering these incredible performances and you don't feel like you are what i don't know what would that feel like and is i i would hope that that point if i find myself on the set i would just eliminate all of that thinking and just be in the scene and you know i'll be as good as i can be but is there any any advice you can give in that regard first of all i'm dying to know who you're talking about because i can't I'll, guess and you'll I'll tell, tell you me off I'll, I'll tell you all fair because i i can't even i can't even make a guess which is good <laughs> which good. is good and which goes to my second point this is all subjective unlike your you know your lists and your evaluations and your tech brain which are know, subjective for me right well you know i watch tv with friends and i'm like oh that actor is brilliant and somebody will go he's terrible you know or vice versa you yeah. know um uh, same with I, I'm, a, I'm a big american idol fan because i'm a singer mm -hmm. and i've been watching american idol with some some friends and they're both singers they're both really highly trained singers and we would disagree on on the singing performances so it, so it is subjective there isn't a pass fail but the most important thing you must do as an actor is fire yourself as a evaluator good you are not allowed to do that job you can't do that job especially regarding your own work it, there is no value in it so so how does this work you're on set you're working yeah and you evaluate whether it's good or bad what is that going to do for you? Nothing. If you go, oh, it's good. Uh, okay, well, you could be wrong. I mean, it's, it's you know, there's no value in it. And also, we're very, very bad. We are, we are if, if people had to apply for the job of evaluating Michael Kostra, I would be the worst candidate for that job. So we have to fire ourselves and yeah. step aside and go, well, whether I stink or not, today, uh, this is my job. I got to go do it. So, yeah. um, uh, and it also takes all the fun out of it if you're evaluating as you go and thinking, how am I doing? How am I doing? It's just no fun. It's, yeah, the, I, it's the, diving into the doing rather than the evaluating is going to save you from a lot of anxiety. And I think that's, again, part of my, you know, uh, maturation as an actor is trying to turn off the analytical brain and not observing yourself and just being and yeah. when i can disconnect all of it and i can just be then everything flows smoothly otherwise it's it's work and i don't want it to be work and just acting wise what helps with that is yeah. a, really getting I, I call it getting under the hood of the car you know but really um identifying what is important to the character what do i want what am i doing what am what am I how what how am I going about trying to get my goals in the scene? What are my obstacles? All the stuff that we learn about in acting class, and really trust that track. That your train is on that track. All the other stuff is bullshit. Okay. This train is on the track of, you know, my character needs to learn how to knit because his girlfriend loves sweaters. That's what I have to do in the scene. Yeah. So. So now I don't have to worry about how well, how I'm doing it or if I'm convincing. I just need to learn how to knit because I want to make my girlfriend a sweater, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, it, again and again, reinvesting as the character in the scene, it sounds so obvious, but it's a thing that we all forget because we're busy evaluating ourselves and trying to get jobs instead of doing what the character is doing. Yeah, and I found the other thing in scenes is, you know, when I, I'm prepared and I'm ready and then when they say uh, action, and you're so focused on blocking, you're focused on making sure that you're, uh, you know, kind of in the right place and the right light and you're saying the right lines that you forget that what you're supposed to be doing in the first place. And yes. it, it takes a lot of practice uh, to do that. It's hard with on-camera stuff because typically directors don't say a lot. Yeah. Right. So it forces us mm -hmm. to develop at least enough self-esteem to go, well, I guess if they don't say anything, I guess it's good. But that's yeah. hard for us because I usually think if somebody doesn't say anything that they hate me. Um, same. Yep. You know? <clears throat> yeah. And again, I, 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 say, I, I say that out loud on interviews like this because I want every actor listening to go, oh, good, it's not just me. Because we all do that. You know, I think a lot of us do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm certainly in that camp. Good, um, these are such good questions, though, because you're, you know, you're really getting up underneath the stuff that so many actors suffer from. So many of us do these things to ourselves. 
So I compliment you on your interviewings. Thank you. I appreciate that. And again, the whole point of this uh, of the series is to talk to real people who are yeah. in this world that I love and I know so many people love, and to get real answers. Not yeah. you know, not the traditional you know, as you would say, red carpet answers. I, I want reality. So I, people can you know not just be entertained, but be inspired and learn and really of course, of course. you know understand the art. Um, yeah. Since we kind of you know, we've been talking about mental health, let's uh, let's dive into that a little bit more. Um, yes. I know, and this is again, you know, my own uh, analysis of of myself, but I've noticed over time that I'm either creative or I'm destructive. Um, that's why I try to find uh, all sorts of uh, creative endeavors, including this one, uh, because then I am happy, then I am fulfilled. If I do anything creative for at least you know 10 to 15 minutes a day, no matter what it is, I'm a poet, you know, I'm a lyricist, I'm an actor, I do all these things, I feel good and it's me. If I don't, I start getting frustrated, I start questioning if, I, if I'm living my essence on this, uh, on this plane and then I'm not as fun to be around. So do you find that uh, you and you know, some of the other actors that you know are in that same space? I have to write down what you just said because I loved it so much that I have <laughs> to find you. a pen and write it now. Okay. I'm not creative, I'm destructive. That is a quote that I will never forget. That's really well well said. Thank so you. I have to I'll write it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it was um, somewhat you know cathartic and painful to admit to myself that that's the reality, but that's what it is. And um, you know, as self-preservation, I want to mention to people that destructive doesn't mean that I, you know, do anything bad to myself or others. It just means it's it's an energy and it's a feeling thing. It's I you're either, either yeah, it's, it's happy. Sort of like, to me, it's like the spiral is going down instead of up. Exactly. It's not really yeah. destructive so much as like yeah. uh, not okay. So I just love what you just said. I I am. Um, I have found that when you are an artist when you have the soul yeah. or the calling and by the way a lot of people go oh do i qualify if you have that desire that yeah. that leaning you know not everybody wants to make art if you have that leaning you have that that's it that's what the calling looks like and yep. if you do you must do art you must do yep. some sort of art yep. it's it's what i call i call it actor vitamins but it could be called artist vitamins Ooh, and I like that. too often um at, too often actors don't do anything unless they're invited. They wait for the invitation to have an audition, to have a job, to have a, you yeah. know, and, um, or, or they, they only want to create something that's going to forward their careers or their visibility or not this nonsense, this commercial nonsense. I will tell you that, as you know from doing, doing these, these co star roles, sometimes they're not artistically fulfilling at all. That's not that you don't get your actor vitamins sometimes. That, yep. That's punching the clock and getting a credit and getting a paycheck. But you invite some friends over and you read a play or these days get on Zoom. I've, I, I've been in, I was invited to join a play reading group, uh, which I did twice a week. We read a play on Zoom. You know, nobody sees it. We're not producing it, but we get to do our thing. And it, it's so, so uh, soothing and comforting and, and yeah. feeds that. It, it gives us our active vitamins. So uh, I have known people who decided not to pursue their art for practical reasons. They wanted to raise a child, they wanted whatever, all fine. But the healthy ones are ones that will then join a community theater or write songs in their basement or, be, you know, or, or, or something so that they feel that they are, because I feel that that artistic expression is our language. It's the way we navigate the world. It's the way we put the world into order for ourselves. And that's just the artist's brain. So yes, I'm, I, 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 apologies again for being long-winded, but you've got me on a passionate subject, which is, yes, you absolutely need to keep feeding yourself those nutrients, uh, yeah. which, is, which is doing some sort of art. It doesn't matter if anybody ever sees it, you know? That's not the point. So yes, yeah. I'm 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 very big into that because I I get very depressed if I don't do anything, you know. Yeah. Um. Thank you. I appreciate your honesty on that as well. Um. As we wrap up, because uh, I've kept you long enough, and I really well, appreciate. No, not even long enough. I, I, when you said that, I was like, oh no, are we done? 
<laughs> I, I have another, you know, 15 questions. So maybe maybe we can uh, we can get together for a part two of this. I would love that, as a matter of fact. Always happy to do that, honestly. What else okay. am I doing? Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so as we wrap up for part one uh, of this interview, um, if you had to give one advice to a earlier version of your acting self, what would that advice be? Ooh, I was such a mess in the earlier earlier version of my acting self. Um, you've stumped me. I what, don't know what I would say. Yeah, it just I uh, think what what would have made the most impact, right? If uh, if you know you were talking to your younger self right now and say, uh, Michael, remember this. This will help you. You really stumped me. I don't know what I would say. This is hard. I mean, you know, this is not going to be very profound. The one, the one mistake that I made was, mm -hmm. you know, we kept hearing about pilot season, this mytho mythological pilot season, yeah. and I'd clear my schedule for pilot season when I had no credits and I, and not and and, a, and an agent who wasn't really on the map, and I'd sit around for pilot season like some magical thing was going to happen. I was going to get pilot. Meanwhile, I would turn down a play, I turned down a job, I turned down a commercial. It's pilot season. I have to stay available. And I wasted a lot of time um, uh, invested in a level that I wasn't at yet, you know. And I, I think, you know, the more, the more profound version of this is uh, we have to constantly, realistically evaluate where we are in our careers and relish where we are as opposed to getting all flipped out about where we, what, the place we haven't reached yet. And we have to be realist, realistic about it. I, I've left paying jobs for pilot season and nothing happened. I sat around and was unemployed. And um, that was a mistake. But that's not, again, I, I apologize for the lack of profundity. I don't know what I would have said to my earlier self. I would, he was, a, he was, you know, he just needed a lot of therapy. That's all I would say. But I think what you actually said was, uh, was profound. And um, one of the biggest things that I realized because Again, when when I told everybody that I'm an actor, uh, it was before I had any credits, I have done anything. It was just the realization and I needed to come out to society, I'm an actor. And people were asking, what have you been in? I said, nothing. They're like, well, you're not an actor. No, I am, because that's who I am. And yes. the rest is just getting to that point. So what you said uh, was profound because I, at that point, when I realized that I'm an actor, I quit my job. I had an IT consulting uh, business that was doing really well. I quit. I said, I'm done. I'm an actor. I'm going to go act. I'm going to write my books, which I wrote my books, and it was very successful, and about 100 people bought it. Um, um, I, I did uh, you know, my first uh, film, and it was wonderful, and nobody cared. It's, it's one of those things where you set yourself up and you're on this incredible high of I am it, world, see me now, and they do, and you're not making any money. So I crawled back to IT crying, admitting to myself that this is not a failure, this is what the bridge looks like in order for me to get there, if it ever, if it ever gets there. And then the realization came that why am I doing this? Am I doing acting for money? Am I doing this for fame? Or am I doing this because that's who I am? And as soon as I made that realization, uh, my IT job, which I used to hate and despise because it was not a right expression of who I am, became, hey, I kind of like doing this. And I love the fact that it's providing an income for me and my family. And I get to do acting, which is my heart. And if anything happens, it will. And I would be in love if it becomes my full-time profession but I'm okay. And I found that balance. So what you said is profound to somebody who was like me, you know, a number of years ago that made this, you know, change of life. I wish somebody like you said that to me saying, don't rush, have You're that so, bridge. So I, was, You're okay. I, was I was accidentally profound. You were, uh, but <laughs> you by know, no accident. Have, you know, gen generally speaking for, for non-actors, for people who are outside of the business, they, they're only aware of actors who are successful. Yeah. You don't see the majority of us, the majority of actors who are not making a living at it. So they only see famous people. So they, so it's easy to think, well, that's what happens when you become an actor. It's like, it's just <laughs> not, it's just absolutely not. So, so yes, I guess, I guess that is, 
it is good advice. Don't quit your day job, as we always say. Very mm-hmm. few people make a living at it. Uh, but do pursue it if it's what your heart, if, you, if that's what you do, you do it. You find a way to do it. Yeah. Okay. No shame in a support job. I've had many of them. Yeah, not at all. And um, again, based on uh, you know one of the things that you were mentioning to Lee, it's it removes the pressure on you lending the job, lending the gig, because oh, yeah. you can just play, and you're not you're you're disconnecting the financial from the acting. Because yes. if something is your passion, uh, as soon as you put that financial aspect of it it becomes too great a burden to bear and you're not focusing in the right uh, way. I, I go back to what my mom uh, said to me once when I was a kid and I still remember it to this day. She, my mom used to bake uh, beautiful cakes and everybody loved them. And everybody was telling her, you need to sell your cakes and you need to do them for other people. And one time she tried and the cake was horrible. And she made a mental note to herself that, you know, if I do this for the money, it doesn't come out the same way. And that got in my brain from a very early age. And once I made that same connection with acting, that I'm not doing this for money. I'm doing this because I love it and I have money coming in. Oh my God, what a freeing experience. I don't have to play that game anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's it's an important thing to me uh, now at the time when I do get paid to do what I do, yeah. to still make it about the art because yes. then, then the art stays good. Yeah. You know, it's it's still about the art. It's remarkable that I get paid for it, but that can't be the main drive. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, what a pleasure uh, talking to you. I really like I really like the way you think, and I understand why you said you heard me and said, "Oh, we 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 have similar ways of approaching things." It's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I can't thank you enough. Uh, thank you, Lee, once again for uh, for introducing me to Michael in this way. Um, Thank you so much for your honesty, for your openness, and for just taking the time to share this information with me and whoever may be listening or viewing at some point in the future. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Thank you.